Welcome to Book Carnival, everyone. My name's Anne, and today I'm delighted to say that we have Wendell Thomas with us with her latest book, Fogged Off. I've got, there we go, uh, another delightful Sid Redondo. But before we get into that, I'd like for those of you that perhaps don't know Wendell, I can't imagine there's anyone out there that doesn't, but just in case, I have a short little bio on her I thought everybody would be interested in. She teaches in the Graduate Film School at UCLA, lectures internationally, uh, has been involved with screenwriting, worked as an entertainment reporter, development executive, script consultant, film and television writer. I mean, she's done it all, and I'm in awe of that. And then she turned herself to writing and came out with um, the very first book, which I loved, which had me embarrassed on an airplane because I didn't realize I was bursting out laughing out loud. And that was Lost Luggage, still my favorite, probably always will be because I got to meet Wendell Thomas at that point, which is very special. Um, she brings us this book, which is the third in the series. We're going to find out what other shenanigans Sid can get into. And I think we're all anxious to do that. Welcome so much, Wendell Thomas. So happy to have you. Okay. Okay, so um, anyway, thank you so much for having me, Anne. I, you know you're my favorite. You're my, only, you're my well, only reason going for this tour in LA. So I love your store. Oh, I know. And I love having you. Fogged off, the third wonderful Sid Redondo. So take it away. Um, anybody have, do you want me to read something first or do you want to just ask some questions, Anne? What do you think? Um, what got you started on this series? What, what propelled you into You've done so many other things in your background. Yeah, I think um, for me, I I had always wanted to write novels, but I didn't have the confidence to do it. And I think, you know, I was an English major in college and I, I worked mostly on Henry James. And so that I, I knew I could never be Henry, Henry James or Faulkner or anything. So I felt un, inadequate to write books, I think. And so I tried scripts instead, but I read a lot of mysteries and starting maybe in my forties, I really started reading a lot of mysteries. And so when I came up with the idea for Sid, I did it as a script first. And when it didn't sell, I kind of couldn't let go of her. And so I, um, I kept wondering, could she maybe be a series? And so I thought I would try it. You know, I had to change the script a lot because the script was, hey, Lily. Um, the script was, a romantic comedy that ended with her together with Roger at the end. And that was like, so I had to make a lot of changes in the story if I was gonna make it a series. And I had to decide if I wanted to keep him and was he gonna recur and like all of those kinds of things. But it was, um, and actually I'll tell you cause James is November and I'm doing National Novel Writing Month right now. I did my 2,700 words today, but um, James went away to England and I, told him I was gonna to try to do this National Novel Writing Month. And if any of you don't know about it, you write 50,000 words, you promise to write 50,000 words in a month. And he just laughed at me because I'm really slow. And, um, and when he came back, I had written, I don't know, more, more than that. And I wrote 300 pages in a month. So I wrote the first draft of Lost Luggage in a month. I mean, it was a mess and it took me like a year and a half to fix it, but I had the, you know, the, the skeleton of it. And once I did that, I thought, well, maybe this will work. So that was kind of, and then I had to fix it and then I had to send it out and all of that stuff. But it was, um, it was, it felt really scary at the time, you know, to, to take the leap that way. So I'm glad, I'm really glad I did. And I can't even say how much I love the mystery community. Like, I feel like I have to keep writing books just to stay in it. Well, it's a special community, definitely. It is. When you were doing script writing, uh, did you do comedy? I did. I did. Well, I tried to do everything, which is a bad idea. But I did. I did. I did several comedies. My very first 
um, screenplay was about a woman who says no to a genie, actually. And, um, and he can't leave her house until she makes the wishes and she refuses because she just knows what happens to these people. And so it's really like the two of them stuck in the house, which was basically as in my, my old apartment in Suen Court or whatever in Carborough. And, um, and then it was so as a fantasy thing and I got an agent with that script and then, um, but I also wrote, I wrote a thriller kind of thing for Showtime and that didn't wind up getting made, but I did that. I, I wrote a kid's movie called Dumpty, which is all is like the Humpty Dumpty origin story. Um, I did um, also just some straight comedies. I did a comedy about the insurance business. So, um, and I also did this Deviling, which that book you were looking at is based on, which is, is a really, really dark kind of book um, mm -hmm. around a man who represents a bunch of women who create, um, commit violent crimes in turn of the century England and he gets all of them off. So yeah, quite, quite a departure. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> it's a real departure. So um, I like to do a lot of things, but I think my agent at the time always wanted me to be like Nora Ephron-esque, like he always wanted me in the comedy lane. And mm -hmm. so I'm pretty comfortable there, I guess. That's probably where I'm most comfortable, but I like writing other stuff. I like writing more dramatic stuff when I have an opportunity to. Well, you do it so well, which is why I ask. It's not easy to write good comedy. Uh, and like I said before, all of the trying to figure out who needed to click what. Um, the Literally, I had people looking at me on the airplane because I was so deep into the book and enjoying it so much and laughing out loud, not realizing I was making a spectacle of myself. And I usually travel alone, so I had no one to give me a nudge, you know. Uh, but it's it's really good uh and it's not i know it's not an easy thing to do and it's a transition Did yeah. you, uh, you obviously didn't find it hard to make that transition to to the novel writing i you know it was the <laughs> hardest thing well the two things were hard um in screenplays you're never supposed to have more than four lines in a paragraph and you're also never ever allowed to be inside anybody's head so those are the hardest two things was, first of all, to do a first person narrative, which I was not allowed to do, you know, in a screenplay, but also just to actually write more than four lines in a row without cutting to something. So it was really that part. But once I got the hang of it, I liked it more, I actually enjoy it more. But it did take me a while to kind of transition a little bit, I think. Yeah. Are there are there some parts of and taking any one of your three books or all of them? Is there any part that you enjoy doing the most? Is it building the scene or uh, building uh, where the character is going to go next? Something that jumps out at you that's your favorite or least favorite? Um, it's so funny. I just we just had this conversation. I was at the Midwest Mystery Convention yesterday, and somebody asked like what, and I said that I like writing the middle the most, and everyone thought I was insane <laughs> because everybody hates writing the middle. Um, but for me, with this and for any of you who don't aren't writers or don't know these terms, it's gets talked about all the time, but I'm a pantser, which means that I don't work out the whole story before I start. I kind of let it come. And so the hardest thing for me, and I'm working on it right now on the new book, which is going to be set in Bali. And I was talking to James about it this morning. The hardest thing for me to do in these novels is to find a believable reason for Sid to leave Brooklyn. So I, that's the hardest part. So even though I like doing the setup and I like being with her family and stuff, in terms of the plot, that's the hardest thing is like, why is she leaving? Why does she have to leave right away? What kind of trouble is she, you know? So that's hard for me. Um, and the end is hard because I don't know what it's going to be. So I really like writing the middle because that's where I can play around and stuff comes to me and it kind of, I can get into a flow. So actually for me, the middle is the favorite. But most people hate the middle. They feel like it's the saggy middle and they don't like it. But I love the middle. So when I get to the middle, which I hope will be not too long from now on the new book, I'll be really happy. Well, when you explain it that way, I understand. But my reaction was the same. Yeah, you know, like what? And, and hopefully that you get to go to Bali. You have to have firsthand knowledge and research, don't you? Well, I mean, the reason I chose Bali in this case is because if I can't go, um, I have two friends who lived there for an extended period, and I'm actually going to stay with one of them in San Francisco next week. So 
the thing you really need, I think, is to know what things smell like. And you need to know some things that aren't in the tourist books. And so I think if I can't actually get there, if I because it's really easy to get there from Australia. So if I can go back and teach in Australia, I can zip over. But I, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen. But the two of them have promised to answer all my questions and give me anecdotes. And and one of them, I think I've mentioned her to you before, Anne, um, Nancy Tingley, she actually wrote a novel called A, a Death in Bali. So she is, um, you know, she's going to really help me get the stuff that you don't get. And I've, I've got a stack of tourist books from um, 2006, because that's when it's set. So I had to go on eBay and get old photos and old Let's Go to make sure that I wasn't, you know, talking about stuff that was ahead of the story. But I think in this one, um, I don't know if any of you know that book, Eat, Pray, Love, but Eat, Pray, Love is going to be like the horror show for Sid because it's a nightmare to get to Bali from Brooklyn and her, all her clients are going to want to go. So it's going to be actually, I think, really fun to do. It sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. But I hope I get to go. I, I'd like to go. Who wouldn't really? I know. <laughs> so if you're if the middle is your fun part, do you leave the beginning and end to the last or do you kind of sketch it in and then fill it out after you've done the middle? No, I do. I do. If I have to do the opening. I mean, I may fix it. And usually I wind up topping about 25 pages out of it, you know, before I'm done. But I have to know why she's going and I have to know what clients or what family or whatever is going to wind up being part of the story. Okay. So if like, for example, in Drowned Under, which is the second book, um, I thought about taking her mom, but then I decided Sister Ellery was going to be better. And so I, I had to find a way for Sister Ellery to be on the boat, which, you know, that was a trickier thing. So one, but once I knew that, then I could get to the middle. So I definitely have to write at least a pass of the opening and get her on a plane and then I can play around so that I do write the first, the ending. I mean, honest to God, that book, I'm so embarrassed, but I'll be honest with you. Drowned Under, the end of that book, I wrote the last 10 pages the day it was due. I, did, I swear to God, James will attest to this. I was a, a basket case, <laughs> I'm nodding. but um, yeah, so that was intense. Not this one, I wasn't quite that bad, but yeah, but it's, you know, I, I think if I don't know what's going to happen, it's a little less likely everybody else is going to. If it's telegraphed so far ahead, I feel like, you know, but it's probably just because I'm sabotaging myself or I'm insane. It could be either. Uh, either I think. Um, I'm looking over here um, and I wasn't going to have chat up, so you ignore it. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Lily says, Lily says, I love all the Sid books, so definitely looking forward to this one. How, well, how did you come up with her name? Oh, that's a good question, Catherine. People don't ask me that very often. Um, I think I was, I love, I always loved just the town Redondo Beach. Like I love Redondo Boulevard. I, I go down Redondo Boulevard on the way to the airport. So that word was in my kind of head. And um. I love old movies and I think Sid Charisse is kind of un, underappreciated. Mm -hmm. So, and when I put those two together, then it felt like a name to me. So that's where it comes from. But she, um, her middle name is Elizabeth Madonna Redondo. So uh, that, that will be explained in later books. But, um, but yeah, that's how I came up with it. And, and I thought it sounded vaguely Italian, although it probably isn't at all. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> No, but it's okay. We love it too. Um, you briefly touched on uh, teaching in Australia. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that a little? I find it fascinating and how it got started. Yeah, I, had, I was really lucky. I've been, um, I was lucky in a lot of ways, but I, I was teaching in England and actually that's how James and I met is I was doing these screenwriting workshops in Northern Ireland and thank heavens he wasn't one of my students. So that was good. Um, and we met there. And then um, on those classes that I was teaching in England and Ireland, I had a student who went to become the head of development for the New Zealand Film Commission. And she brought me over there. And when I was there, I met the woman who was the head of the Melbourne International Film Festival. And she brought me to Australia. And once I was there, then I met most of the people in the film 
community there. So I got invited to a couple of different agencies. They all have each state in Australia has a different film agency. There's Screen Queensland, there's Screen Australia, there's Film Victoria. And so I would go work for those. And I had a, my latest thing has been with Screen Queensland, but sadly I haven't been able to go back. I had three trips planned for them. I was gonna do 12 lectures for them um, in 2020. And I still have my plane tickets are sitting and, you know, on the Qantas website, <laughs> non used. So, yeah, so I do um, I do kind of the same stuff I do here, but I do these six hour lectures. That's kind of my specialty. So and on specific topics and I use tons of video clips and stuff. So that's what I do. But I also mentor writers there. I've done a couple of mentorship projects long term. Yeah, I like it there. I really love it there, actually. If I weren't too old, we would immigrate, but I'm keep I'm stopping us from doing that because you can't, they, they cut it off at 60. Really? And New Zealand's 55, so oh. yeah. I never heard that before, okay. Yeah, well, I wish I'd heard it sooner. We might've <laughs> moved there 10 years ago. I know. Oh, um, I'm having to watch up here. We're still getting people in. Okay. Um, it, it is, yes. And I had a question and it's gone. So let, let's keep you talking for another couple of minutes. You had, uh, I, okay, I'll throw it out. Uh, you are, you post daily record songs that you enjoy. You're big on the books. I think you know absolutely everybody in the book writing industry and they all know you. And you're a film person who appreciates old films. And I, I don't find too many that do. I love that because I love them also. Uh, the pandemic brought out the worst in me and I binged on old films a great deal during this well, that's period. The, that's the best review, man. Exactly. So how did you get such a broad background in all of these things? Um, I don't know. I think it's because I'm really unfocused probably, but I, um, I think I, it's funny, I wrote an, a, post about this last week for the jungle reds about how I've kind of let fate kind of rule my life and um I think and I um when I was in graduate school I was doing um work on Sam Shepard and they didn't know what to do with me so they shoved me in the film department so I started teaching undergraduate film classes I was the TA and I felt unqualified so in a year I watched 400 movies I just went through the list of all the movies I should have watched in my life. And I went to the library and it was when VHS were fairly new. And I just rented a, a movie or two a day and sat there with my headphones on and watched 400 movies. So I got a decent you know, education. And then when I came to Los Angeles, I just went to the movies like three times a week, um, which was great. And I've always been a big reader when I was a kid. So I think, um, I think that's part of it maybe, but I, I think I really loved, um, I have a really good retro house near our, our house. It's, it's filled with hipsters now, sadly, so we can't just run over five minutes before, but it's the New Beverly Cinema. It's now owned by Quentin Tarantino. And it was the, one of the reasons I moved to the neighborhood and it had double features of all the old films, everything from Barbara Stanwyck and Catherine Hepburn to Bertolucci to Fellini to like all of that stuff. And so, I went to those movies as much as I could because it was a block away from my house and they were $5. So I, I think I just loved movies. And um, poor James is bombarded because we have like 800 VHS tapes in our house and over a thousand DVDs. So it's pretty intense here. And he- oh, uh, Today I went through your list. You gave me a list of the movies uh, and I went through it and I was proud. I've seen about half of them uh, cool. and I'm working on the rest of them. Those are ones I didn't appreciate at the time they came out, but I'll work on that. No, it's all, and, and in terms of the music, I mean, I was just always, I bought singles from the time I was in, I think I got my first transistor radio in 1967, because I think the number one song was Ode to Billy Joe, which I remember. And I used so to I. pause it and listen to my transistor radio. So as soon as I had any allowance, I would go to the record bar, which Gigi and Susan know very well. And, um, and I would get, a single and then once I was in college I bought $15 a week so I buy three albums a week for you know five bucks each and so I have a lot of albums and actually I started doing the album cuts of the day because I gave we really do have too much stuff in our house he is absolutely right about that so I probably got rid of I mean 
five, 600 albums or something. I still have a lot, but, um, and so I just, it made me so sentimental. I started going through and, you know, coming up with songs, album cuts or songs from a, obscure. And then, you know, I've been doing it for two years. I think my anniversary is coming up. So I think I've done like 700 songs or some ridiculous thing, but it's fun. It's fun for me. And so I, some people, you know, I have a couple of people that check in every day with that. I have some people who I come out of nowhere and I'm like, how, where have you been for the last three years? But um, it's just fun for me to do. So I like me, obviously media, you know, I, I like entertainment, I guess is what it is. So I don't know I, if that makes any sense, but I. It does. Well, and you've reminded me of not only the movies that I had seen originally or missed, but uh, songs that I had forgotten about. And some of them that I don't even recognize. So you, you catch me on both ends of that one. Getting back to your wonderful book, Fogged Off, you took her to London. And did you want to read any portion of your book or do you just want to talk about it? It's what, does anybody want to just hear the first chapter or some of you may, you do? Yes. Okay, I'll do my best. I, I'm a little hoarse today, so bear with me. I'm going to move you guys down so I can see my screen. Well, okay. it's kind of a sexier tone that way. <laughs> I wish. I wish that were the case. Um, okay, so this um, this book takes place really just like about a month or not even a month after the last book. So it starts in January 2007. And um, so I'm just going to read the first chapter for you. Jack the Ripper had it made. Sid, if you're going to babble, babble en route. Debbie Pinkowski slept a 20 on the deli counter, grabbed our Italian heroes, and shoved me out the door. I'm not endorsing spree killers or anything. It's just, you know, no surveillance. I could hear Debbie's eye roll over the click of my kitten heels. Seriously, the man, if it was a man, sliced up five women in public, walked home drenched in blood and entrails, and it's still getting away with it hundreds of years later. I have one drink, one drink with Sally Jessup's cousin in Queens for God's sake. And it winds up in the Bay Ridge Sentinel. Now I'm a pariah again. He's off limits, everybody knows that. He's off limits for sex or marriage, not bourbon. Bourbon leads to marriage. I am living, breathing 150% proof that that's not true. I checked my watch. It was street cleaning day. We sped up. Debbie and I had race walked in sync since the first day of kindergarten, when we both sprinted for the 30 foot rectory wall to escape Sister Ignatius Clara Clegg's lead field ruler. We bonded over matching broken ankles and had been avoiding punishments and parking tickets together ever since. We turned on to 77th Street. It was still lopsided. It might be lucky. Bay Ridge, Brooklyn's alternate side parking meant when the city cleaned one side of the street, everybody just double parked on the other, making the whole neighborhood list to one side. This inevitably led to neighborly altercations, i.e. assaults, in the hours when half the neighborhood was blocked in. The instant the time was up, if you hadn't moved, they'd hit you with a huge ticket like the one on the windshield of my emerald green 1965 Ford Galaxy 500. One of my New Year's resolutions had been to swear less. Well, that didn't last. As the youngest and only girl in a family of 10 macho, overprotective cousins, I tended to swear a lot, especially when the object was the Department of Parking Services, and I used the word services loosely. See, this is what I'm talking about. How can I be the only person with a ticket? It's big brazen everywhere I go. I can't sneeze without somebody giving me a Benadryl. Bay Ridge still felt like a small town, made smaller by the fact that I either was related to, had gone to school with, or dated about 70% of the population and had booked the other 30% for their golden retirement getaway. How can everyone know I ate a whole box of weed thins in one sitting? Is someone going through my recycling on an hourly basis? You ate a box of wheat thins in an hour? So? I glared at her, then at the ticket, tempted to tear it up. 
But if I did, there'd be no chance my brother Frank, newly restored to detective status, could fix it for me. I rammed it into my red vintage Balenciaga bag and considered relocating to Iceland, which was 30% off at the moment on Lufthansa. I unlocked the door for Debbie. We were doing an underground poker game I needed to win and no one in my family needed to know about. I checked the rearview mirror every six seconds for familiar vehicles and tuned my scanner for the 68th precinct. We were almost through Fort Hamilton when my new cell phone rang. Debbie held it up to my ear. Said Redondo, Redondo travel. Debbie commandeered the wheel while I repeated a few rights and okays. And finally, thank you, bye. She sighed as I took the wheel back and started the 15 point turn the acre wide galaxy required. So what is it this time? The Gotties leave their CPAP at Euro Disney? Nope, body. So that's chapter one. Thank you. Very well. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm, sure, I'm sure James will have notes for me later. <laughs> um, so we have everybody unmute and ask you questions. Oh, good. Absolutely. Right. Can Please. you all? Let's see. Can... There we go. Good. Is that working? Everybody's still muted. Okay. Are they? I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, let's go this way. <laughs> James is writing you another note. I, <laughs> I know James can't talk to me either, huh? <laughs> I this hasn't happened before. I don't know what I've done. Leave it to me to find something I can't undo. And if you hit participants, okay. Oh, let people put the questions in the chat instead. But I still want to talk to them. If you go, if you hit participants on the bottom, it'll say eleven people or whatever, right? Correct. You may be able to go up somewhere in that and unmute people. When I click the little arrow, it says invite. But if you go to, do you see that everybody will have a, a microphone? Yes, I see that. Then just go on each of them and take it off. I, just I, touch it, right? So the ones that have the red line through them, just hit I, it. I see it, Wendell, and I'm doing that. Nothing's happening. It's not working. That's so weird. Uh, I know I haven't had this happen before. It's really weird. All right. Well, I then I'm happy to have people put stuff in the chat if you want. I'm happy to answer. Yeah, please. Um, I'm still this one person keeps trying to get in. I've let them in a couple of times. So let's see. All right. Anybody typing anything in? Uh, otherwise, I'll keep playing with microphones here. I'm sorry, Wendell. No, it's no problem. Because I think Lily, yeah. you, you look. Like you can talk now. <laughs> How are you? It's so lovely to see you. I'm oh. very, very almost in person. I know. Okay. I know. It's so fun to be connected. I know. On, on Facebook and all social media, so I can keep up with your adventures. Yeah, well, you as well. But I'm happy to see your face. Your moving. Your face. your life. No. <laughs> well, Lilia, your how life you is an adventure, uh, and that's great. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. I cannot hear you for whatever reason. That's weird. I can hear you though. Um, we can hear you. But I can see I'm unmuted and Anne and Wendell, but everybody else is muted. Oh. So I, I'm with you, James. I think people can start posting questions on the chat mm -hmm. and we can okay. learn there. That's fine. That's fine. So, um, but Lilia, you were muted before. So, what did you do? Anything? Because you're, I can hear, I can hear, I can hear, hear Lilia. Huh, okay. Funny. Okay, so Marsha, is that, how do I come up with Sid's hometown and all our relatives? That's such a good question. Um, well, I think I, I did have a very specific, actually my hypnotherapist, I don't think I've ever started a sentence with that, those two words before, but I'm doing it. So, um, used to live in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And when I was looking around for a place where everyone, I wanted an urban environment, but uh, where everybody knew everybody, which was kind of unusual. 
and she had lived in Bay Ridge. And so she suggested it to me and I started reading about it. And then when I read about it, I think I put this in the first book. It's one of the few, it, they call it an N-O-R-C, which is a naturally occurring retirement community, right? So everybody stays there. So when they grow, grow up, they never leave. And so it seemed really insular in that way. And I thought that would kind of be a funny place. And then when I went, um, I went into the bookstore and the women in the bookstore said, we can't go anywhere without seeing like five people from second grade. And so they, it takes everybody forever to go anywhere in the town because they run into, they know everyone. So I just thought that was funny. And so I also thought I wanted, I had to come up with some reason that she hadn't gone anywhere as a travel agent, because otherwise, how am I going to explain that? So I thought if she had a really overprotective family, that would help. And then somehow, I don't know, I just came up with these 10 cousins, you know, and then I was like, okay, well, if she's got 10 male cousins, she's got to have at least three or four uncles and aunts or, you know, to figure that out. So they kind of came from there. And I, I honestly don't know how I came up with Uncle Leon as a taxidermist. That just popped into my brain. I have no idea, but he's now my favorite. I have to say of everyone from this, after this book, he's my favorite relative. And, um, and I wanted her to be, I wanted her to have some sadness and, and have a reason for her to kind of feel responsible to all these people. So I thought if she lost her dad when she was little and they had all taken her and her mom in that, that would kind of create that. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I did go to Bay Ridge and I, the people there were so nice to me and the guy at Chadwick's, I talk about this restaurant, it's a real restaurant. Um, just sat me down, gave me some crab cakes and made a list of all the places I needed to go. He was like an angel, Jerry. So I really, it was really, I, it felt like it was meant to be because I stayed at a hotel and she's like, oh, go to Chadwick's. And then I went there and he's like, go to see this woman. And then, and I could walk everywhere and I just kind of took tons of pictures. And so does that answer, Marcia? Is that, is that an answer? <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Um, did I write any screenplays for The Sopranos? No, no, I didn't. I wish I had. My friend Jim Manos did. He wrote that college, the college episode and got one an Emmy for that, but I wish I'd done that, but I didn't, no. Um, okay, any other questions? Anybody wanna write anything? I'm screaming, I'm scrolling through. Is everybody still muted? Yes, unfortunately, James has sent me the instructions and I'm trying to follow them, but it's not working. All right, well, James, yes. So somebody asked, did I research Jack the Ripper? It's a good question, because this this yeah. does take place on the Jack the Ripper walks. And I will tell you, um, just nobody's really asked this, but in case you want to know, I am, um, a lot of this book takes place among the world of the London walking tours, the tour groups and the tour guides. And I, um, that was a really lucky thing for me because the first time I went to London, I took a London walk um, with this woman, Emily Richard. And she was so great that I went on like four of her walks. And by the time I left, we were, we had each other's addresses and we corresponded. And like the second or third time I came back to London, she asked if I wanted to stay in her house, which is going to save me like $5,000. So of course I said, yes. And then, um, She's married to Edward Petherbridge. I don't know if any of you know him, but he was the Lord Peter Whimsey um, on that series, the one with Harriet Walter. So they're, they're actors with the Royal Shakespeare Company and they, but they also were London Walks guides. And all they did all the time was complain <laughs> about the London Walks and how everybody stole each other's material and people would try to show up and take other people's walkers and their bosses were horrible to them. And it was like, it was hilarious. And so, um, and then the Jack the Ripperters were the most like backbiting because they're the most, everybody wants to go on those. And so this idea of like all these backbiting walking tour guides was just hilarious to me. And so I thought it would be a fun world. And I also thought it would be a someplace where there would be a lot of suspects for a murder of a Jack the Ripper guide. So. So that's, I, but I also did, a, I did a fair amount of reading on Jack the Ripper. I didn't want a lot of um, gore in the book, but I did at least need to know something about the way the tours worked. And I actually did get in touch with a couple of the tour guys to see like 
how they did the tour, exactly where the walks were, because you can't do them in order or it'll take like five hours. So like how they made choices in terms of the spots of the murders and that kind of stuff and some research on the women. So I did do some of it, but I, I'm not, I mean, there are a million Jack the Ripper experts in the world of which I am not one, but I definitely did some research on that for sure. Um, so from Catherine, screenplay or, um, novel writing novel writing um you know they are really different and i do still enjoy screenwriting because i think it's more it's a little more dialogue driven which i really like writing dialogue but the thing that i really enjoy about writing novels is there's just a little more flexibility in terms of the structure you still have to figure the mystery out and there is that puzzle so there are demands there but a screenplay things really kind of need to happen on a certain page or within you know it's a much more restrictive and sometimes that can be fun because then you're like okay well I can't go off on a tangent because you know I it it's like a sonnet you have to write it, it a certain way but it ultimately I think I do enjoy the novel writing better partly because I can be inside my character's head because I, I really can't do that in a screenplay so I think that's the one thing that's more fun for me is writing that first person voice because I think Sid's funnier in the book than she was in the scripts, you know, because then you only had what she said to other people, but you didn't have her own. And I, for me, I have more fun writing her internal monologue. So if that makes, does that make sense? It does. Uh, also, um, if you're doing a script, you have to take into consideration what the actress would be able to do physically. Yeah. And some of the things you've had her do in books <laughs> would be a challenge. It would require some special effects, I think. I think possibly uh -huh. that I always, the helicopter scene um, in Drowned Under where she has to be dropped on a cruise ship, that would be hard to do. You'd have to have a pretty good stunt person to do that, I think. Yeah, a but fun, a fun with, challenge, but still. Yeah, so I think I, nobody's asked me this, but I am, um, my personal choice for Sid, if she were still alive, would be Barbara Stanwyck. Like that's who she is in my head because she's little, you know, and she's tough, she's a tough broad and, but she's really cute. And I, so Barbara Stanwyck obviously in like the comedy is not in double <laughs> indemnity, but I, I love her. So she would be my choice. Um, she did that comedies very well. She really did. The Lady Eve, I love that movie so much. Yeah. Um, so I love her and Ball of Fire is one of my favorite movies ever. Have you seen that, Anne? Do you right. know Ball of Fire? Yeah. 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 It's so great. No, excellent. Uh, if you uh, pick someone today, uh, do you have anybody that you think would fit? You know, it, it's funny. I think there's some, it has to be somebody who can do physical comedy. And I don't think there are as many people that can do that as there used to be. So it's a little bit tougher to choose. I mean, the one person who can do physical comedy, although she's not physically like the way I've described Sid, is actually... Um, Kate McKinnon from Saturday Night Live, like she can do, she has that rubber body and she can do, so I love her, but she would, it would be a different way to go. I think Anna Kendrick might work possibly from oh. Perfect and from, yeah, she's physically more like Sid and she can be funny. Um, I also, we were talking the other night, I think um, I, actually Zoe Deschanel might work mm -hmm. as Sid. Um, but it's a little bit hard because it does have to be somebody who can do physical comedy like Lucy did it, you know, but it has to be somebody now. And I would love some recommendations if anybody can think of anyone they love that would be good because I, I it has been a little bit hard to figure it out, I think, for me. I, I But I want Uncle Leon to be Christopher Walken. Like that is my dream. So I'm putting that out there in the universe right now. Okay. And hopefully someone who wants to make a series out of this will listen. I hope so. I'd love a series. It would be wonderful. Yeah, it would be good. It would be expensive. So I think that's why I've been hesitating taking it out a little bit to get rejected. Because I do think that it is, you know, especially now when it's so hard, it's so much harder to film because of COVID. It having a lot of different international locations is trickier. Well, I'm just thinking of the future when everything's going to be wonderful. Yeah. But no, it would, I think it would be fun to do, but it's um, because I always wanted it to be Romancing the Stone. That was always my dream of what the series was like, you know, 
So I, I always wanted an adventure movie. That's what was my original idea. So maybe. And if, it, if it happened, would you want to do the script or would you step back like so many other authors have done? Um, you know what I think I would do? I would ask to have the first pass and then I would walk away. Like if they, if they wanted, then I would walk away because I, I've been in the movie business a lot and I, there's a huge scandal now about Sue Grafton because, you know, she worked in the movie business and TV first and she was like, never saw my books, never, never, never. My grandchildren, I'll come back and haunt you. And her husband and her kids just sold the book rights oh. three weeks ago. Okay. So I, but she knew, you know, if you've been on that side of the business, you know how things get ruined. And you know how, you know, you, how you have no control. I mean, Michael Connolly has a lot of control over Bosch, but he, his original, the first book of his that was adapted, he hated so much that he like, didn't let anybody have rights to anything for like 15 years or something. And when he came back, he was like, I want this and this and this, and he had the power to do it, but I wouldn't have that. So, you know, and look at Jack Reacher, Tom Cruise, like, how did that happen? So. You have to, you know, yeah. I would have to say, but if I got one pass on the script, at least I had a shot and then, and I got paid and then, you know, I, I would have to be able to give it up, but I'd always have the book, you know, the book doesn't, the book still exists. So I think that's better than having writing a original screenplay that gets completely changed and you don't have anything. You, you, you can say, well, it used to be like this and people are like, right. But it, if you have the books, you still have the books. So I feel, you know. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking to see if we somebody slipped anything else in here. <laughs> Any um, I sincerely apologize for whatever throws everybody out. Um, I've never tried to mute them before. And I've tried James' suggestion three times and nothing pops up that looks the same. Uh, it's been a wonderful event, though. Thank you so much, everyone, to, for coming. And I've missed you all so much. I cannot wait. And Anne will tell you, but I'm going to be in person with Naomi Hirohara, the goddess, um, and with Jen Chow and Ellen Byron on December 11th. So that should be really fun. And that that's going to be, I mean, in person is going to be exciting enough. But with yes. those women, that'll be fantastic. So, and I think are you going? We're going to do maybe some special deals with gift boxes of multiple books or something. So I don't know what we'll do, but. Yeah, it, it's going, it's getting to be quite Christmassy with this one. Uh, there's going to be gift wrapping and um, origami things. Uh, so yeah, you have to come and take advantage of all of that. Those of you that are out of state, I apologize. You're going to miss out. But anyone who's in town, tell your friends and come and visit. And I will tell everyone who is out of town that Anne can get you any book. And she also has an incredible collection of first editions, mystery novels and other things. She is, and she's very good about mailing stuff. I buy stuff from her all the time that she sends to me. So if you're ever looking for the ace to find you something special, she will have it. It's a pleasure. I always enjoy that. It's Book Carnival. And you'll see the name under my name. And we love to hear about you. Um, Wendell, you've just done yourself proud. Despite all the problems that we had with this, I think it was wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again to my, my old friends and my friends from Book Carnival for coming. I'm so happy to see all of you and I really appreciate supporting the series. I, it, may, it means so much to me. So thank you and James, James will attest. So I'm so glad. Um, <laughs> we love it and we love you. Take care now. See you in December. All right. See ya. Thank Bye -bye. you, Wendy. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. So much for coming. Bye, Susan. Bye, Rebecca. <laughs> now everybody's unmuted. Okay. <laughs> now, they're unmuted. now that happened. That happened. All right. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye. And I'm just going to stay for a second to say goodbye to you. Okay. Um, Um, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry about all this. I don't know how, what happened, but I, you know, Zoom, there's always something, right? Remember when we did Lynn Trust and we couldn't hear, like every second word dropped out. And yesterday we were on this Midwest 
thing and one of the people didn't have a headset and it echoed it was like hello 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 like the whole interview was like I could and it was the comedy panel so I just kept laughing and I was like this is perfect but it was I'm, I'm sure the moderator was like horrified so but you know you have to go with whatever happens everybody's had a couple of zoom moments that's just the deal well, the the funny thing is with this uh zoom is that well i was slammed one time so actually you came off lucky they a uh, whole gang bombarded the event that i was having but you got bombed oh no yeah and it was funny to start with yeah, but then they got kind of nasty so i had i shut everything down and logged back in again a few minutes later and fortunately they were gone and all my customers came back on oh, that's good and so the event went forward uh but I'd, ne I'd never had that happen before. Yeah. I had read about it. You know, I, I had a minute where I thought, wow, should I post the link on Twitter? You know what I mean? But then I was like, I want people to come. So, um, so and you it had a nice turnout. Oh, good, good. I'm glad you're happy. So I hope they'll buy the book from you. Oh, I, I hope so too. But uh, no, I, I find that this is the most, um, it, it should be very simple to do this but it's something a little different every time you do it. Uh, most of the time it works beautifully and literally, uh, poor James, he kept texting me or <laughs> messengering me. And I went down and I did all the things he was saying to do and nothing happened. You no, know, I could see it wasn't working. I could see you trying, so I don't know what it was. Uh, and yet at the end, several of your friends were unmuted and were able to speak. Yeah, it's weird. So I have no idea what that is. No. Because I've so never, I, yeah because I'm the host a lot for all my UCLA classes and stuff and usually that will work but I don't mute them very often and they mute themselves and unmute themselves so sure. uh, group mute but well, but James tried he's your hero he tried very hard my hero and um okay good so I will um and if anybody wants to buy a book I'll sign it in December you know what I mean yes. no I've told everybody that because I've sold several copies already I'll be happy to sign it anytime. And um, yeah, I told them just to bring it back with themselves in December. Okay, cool. And do yeah. you? Yeah, so it'll be great. I can't wait. And I will, um, I'll email you if I have any other questions, but I'm looking forward to December very much. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's always fun. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye bye now. Bye. Love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye bye.